why is it that america still has blinkers on how many more times do they have to be stabbed in the back by pakistan how many more times will they get bitten by the snake no my reading is somewhat different i mean mm. i don't think there has bothered about pakistan as they were till they left afghanistan in august 2021 It's really we have a problem with Pakistan. Therefore, anything little that gets done with Pakistan, we tend to see that as uh, as a as a major kind of U.S. commitment to Pakistan. I think we've seen two things happen in the last one year. One, they gave some maintenance grants for the for the F-16. Second, they've given them some aid for the flood relief. Look, I think we have to shake off our Pakistan obsession in a way, because our economy today at 3.5 trillion dollars. is 10 times bigger than pakistan's at 3.5 bill uh, 350 billion dollars so i think pakistan is in real bad shape right now they have only 5 billion dollars of reserves uh, less than a month's imports a pakistan the economy has never been in such a bad shape as it is while they'll continue to be a nuisance you know continuing to do cross border terrorism etc i think pakistan where it was in the 1950s as a critical ally for the west as a leader of the islamic world as a potential major country in the developing world to one way i think they're going around with a you know asking everybody for money and that's not a, a pleasant thing to situation to be in and uh, they found that uh, china could not reverse india's abrogation of the article 370 they tried to push it in the un security council embassy in uae and mbs in uh, saudi arabia the best friends of mr modi mm. uh, so this idea that the two islamic countries will back pakistan that has proven uh, wrong so barring China and Turkey there is very little international support for Pakistan mm. but we must also not expect that Pakistan at 200 million people with nuclear weapons one of the large armies that nobody should do anything with Pakistan you know we're not going to be in that situation ever you know our russian friends were trying after all they enticed imran khan to show up yeah. the day before they invaded ukraine so i think pakistan's location gives it some importance which is the only reason it yeah. gets important yeah. uh, broadly agree i mean but you know in uh, pakistan's gdp today is less than maharashtra's hmm. and one indian state at every meeting of think tanks that uh, i have attended or uh, you know spoken everybody wants the same thing end the war end the war end the war do countries see india as somebody who can like at least talk to russia to end the war but can india ever play a role i mean is no no mm-hmm. okay. and i think our minister uh, is also made it very clear for me sajay shankar you know look i think don't arrogate yourself look we want peace we want talks but i don't think there's any illusion in delhi that somehow we are the brokers of peace hmm. there's only one country that can make peace which is the united states which today if it pulls the plug on arms supplies to ukraine ukraine's ability to fight will go down and the russians will only negotiate with the americans they're not going to negotiate with the ukrainians they're not going to negotiate with the europeans they think they're too too small Hmm. so i think it's really uh, it's really only the us can do it and at this time uh, i think they committed to supporting ukraine and ukraine's attempt to regain its uh, you know uh, territory from russia but where it this ends we don't know there are voices in the us which hmm. are calling for a dialogue which are calling for a settlement but again the problem is said look it's very easy many indians might tell ukraine why don't you just give eastern ukraine to russia and then they'll be happily live ever after Indians would love saying that yeah, but, but would, would not do that would you do that, you do that on Kashmir no. just or give Arunachal Pradesh to uh, the Chinese yeah, exactly <laughs> no in, nobody wants to give an inch of their territory and very few realize that i think when it comes to other countries mm, yeah. we don't have the strength we are not the principal mover and shaker mm. in europe but we have to adapt to that situation which is what we are doing but i think the us debate is worth watching because in europe is divided mm. you have the central europeans who have a border with russia they totally opposed to any settlement with russia that does not give long term guarantees what is the guarantee russia won't do what it has done to ukraine tomorrow to poland tomorrow to moldova so for them this is not just about you know ukraine but this is about the nature of russian power they worry about russia's historic imperial tradition so they worry about it but if you're sitting in france Or, or sitting in Germany, they say, "Yeah, okay, let's find some solution," uh, but Ukrainians are not ready to accept it. So I think that leaves the Americans as the most important interlocutor. On the Indian role, I think realizing this, there are ways. No grand negotiations, and I don't think you want to to, to go there for all the reasons Dr. Rajamohan said. But there are ways where India can make sort of uh, tactical uh, interventions, and there have been a few cases of this. 
So, for example, a statement at the G20 summit, um, which was for working with the Russians particularly to uh, get them to agree to a statement. Um, working on the grain, Black Sea grain deal, uh, which Turkey and the UN primarily brokered, but India played a small role in, in getting the Russians to live up there in the bargain. On the denuclearization of, um, or not targeting nuclear reactors. Um, so uh, potentially POW exchanges in the future. So, you know, the, if both sides are, you know, looking for an honest broker, a third party, India is one of many countries that they could turn to potentially if they wanted to. So I think that those are some of the things where India can play a, a tactical, instrumental role, but I think we have to be realistic about it. You're going to go into a pre-election year. I mean, mm. you're already in the pre-election mm. year. Mm. How much longer can they stomach this thing, you know, expenditure and interest? The interest, I think, is, you know, that's fine will again be. because you... Yeah, no. but, but that's less of an issue again because they're not US troops fighting there. I think the expenditure will become more of a question, hmm. uh, which is, you know, why are we spending 40 billion or whatever, 100 billion dollars? It'll be perhaps by the end of the year uh, when we can be spending that on infrastructure at home, on jobs or, you know, on, on other things but or on also, the border immigration. I would add to what the US has gained, for example. I mean, their oil companies are raking it in. Hmm. Yeah. And even to the, you know, President Biden has warned them but they're private companies and they're really making, making it big. U.S. technology companies are in a big way involved in the war. Uh, for example, Starlink, Elon Musk's satellite system you know, has mm. been very important for the Ukrainians. You have this new software called you know, Palantir Software, American software, AI, artificial intelligence being used mm. to give you know, better information to the Ukrainian soldiers to target the Russian forces. So I think that is the second. Third, I think NATO has expanded. Hmm. If you remember just two years ago, uh, President Macron was saying NATO was brain dead. But today, Sweden and Finland, which were historically neutral countries, have joined NATO. Uh, this war has helped America to put pressure on Germany. See, Germany had it great. You know, the Americans were defending them. They could do business with Russia and China. But now they're telling the Germans, you can't play both sides. Hmm. Uh, so I think Germ they, they managed to put a lot of pressure on Germany. So I think it's multiple gains for the United States. Dhruva, you know, you take your eyes off Pakistan mm -hmm. and you pay the price for it. Do you remember the two times that America took its eyes off Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Thinking it's a small country, like, you know, wag the tail kind of a situation. But it does happen. No, no, I, you can't I, the, take your eyes off some countries. No, no, there are certain ways I think where Pakistan is, and we found this recently, where they have, I mean, there's some counterterrorism cooperation that they have now reopened the line to, it seems, um, with the US. So it's, you know, we went from a zeroing out of US-Pakistan engagement after August 2021 to something. It, it's unlikely now to go back to where it was before, but there is some counterterrorism cooperation happening. There is the, uh, the aid uh, relief. There's another factor as well, which is a domestic political factor in Pakistan, which is, I think Imran Khan had gone so far in his anti-Americanism that the US sees an opportunity uh, in engaging some of the other actors, particularly as the current government, let's see how long it lasts. So I think that, that some of these factors have uh, are at play. Now I think the US sees a little bit of an opportunity to kind of... Uh, I think the source thing. of threat to us comes from Pakistan's relationship with China. Hmm. A Pakistan that becomes subservient to China. That After all, the US did not give nuclear weapons to Pakistan. It China was China did. that gave nuclear weapons. I'm not saying take your eyes off Pakistan. Pakistan poses a real and existing threat to us. Even in its weakest moments, it can continue to do damage to our interests. But we must never take our eyes off Pakistan because it's right next to you. There's right. no way you can take your eyes off.